Okay, afternoon folks. Rob Mountford here with you again today. Uh, I'll just flick the webcam on quickly just to say a quick hello. Uh, I won't leave that on too long because I've just recently had uh, another level four lockdown haircut. So you're not going to want to watch that one for long. So I'm gone now. Um, welcome into the Resine Exterior Steel webinar where the focus will be on atmospheric corrosion and achieving durability with paint coatings. It's another change of pace for us today as we really get into some more in-depth technical information on steel, corrosion and coatings amongst other things. To present this today, I managed to twist the arm of Resine's corrosion consultant, John Kilby, who is our specialist in this area. John also covers a number of other areas at Resine, including being in business development with Resine Coatings Technologies, which is the part of our business that works on innovation, along with much of our export markets and bulk factory applied products here in New Zealand. I'll just run quickly through John's background for you. Uh, he has over 35 years experience in the industry now and has much experience in architectural and industrial coatings for applications including petrochemical, pipeline crossings, in-sea marine, road and rail bridge spans, structural radio masts, lighthouses, air bridges, chemical plants and wastewater plants. And he's suitably qualified in coatings inspection and testing along with coding development and specification writing. Uh, John has developed and run the internal Resine technical staff training program here in New Zealand, as well as developing and implementing of the engineered coatings training program for their Resine Pacific Islands group. Um, just to list a number of John's qualifications, he's ACA certified hot dip galve inspector, CBIP certified coatings inspector, ASSDA stainless steel specialist and ACA certified corrosion technologist. Now, if that list wasn't long enough for you, in his spare time, John's also uh, has a passion for flying and he uh, has his commercial pilot's license. So just to go off script here a little bit, um, that, that list has left me feeling suitably inadequate around my lack of continued learning so uh, I certainly need to pull my finger out a bit um, to try and catch up to John. Uh, before I hand over today I would note that we won't be answering questions as there is a lot to get through again today however as always please do type them into the question area we will keep a record of them and we'll certainly respond directly to you after the webinar. Today's presentation will also be available, uh, is also available in the handouts area for download, but will also be available um, with the webinar itself on our website in a couple of days as we always upload them. Uh, so without further ado, I'll pass over to John now to kick things off. All yours, John. Well, thank you very much, Rob. That was a bit of an introduction, wasn't it? So I've just got the webcam on to say hi to you guys and I'll turn it off now because you don't need to look at me. Um, okay, so today we're going to do atmospheric corrosion and achieving durability. And Rob's already gone over the bits and pieces that I do in the background. The most important bit is 35 years in the paint industry, which I have actually enjoyed, and it's a good career and a good business to be involved with. So the purpose of this presentation is to overview the basics of steel protection by use of paints and look into issues that can commonly be seen during the construction phase. So we'll take our time and we'll plot through it. But uh, here's a list of what we're going to actually cover today. We're going to do the very basics of corrosion, environmental corrosivity, macro and micro environments, design implications, preparation of steel, paint systems and standards, painting conditions, common defects and issues, QA documents, and durability and maintenance. So there's a bit to cover, but we'll plot our way through it and see how we go. So this is the only chemistry today, it's 60 seconds long, so just bear with me, but it's important we understand the basic principle of corrosion. So here we have a piece of steel, and on that steel we have the areas of negative charge, which are anodes, and areas of positive charge, which are cathodes. And once we introduce water to the situation, water's a conducting solution, we call it an electrolyte, so once we introduce the water to the steel, we have 
a creation of current flow and electrical current, which is electrons, move from the anode towards the cathode. This creates the iron to dissolve, and you've got some ferrous ions there. And we have the extra electrons at the cathode. Now they combine with water and oxygen, etc., and create a hydroxide solution. Now these combine together to react and make ferrous hydroxide. And the ferrous hydroxide then reacts with oxygen and water to create hydrated ferric oxide, and that's what we call rust. Just on the left hand side, you saw some NaCLs. I'll give you a guess what that is. That's salt. And I just want to point out that if you put salt into water, it speeds up the conductive reaction, so it speeds up rusting. The key here is water initiates this entire response you've just seen in front of you. And if we can stop water getting to the steel, then we won't have corrosion. And in that case, we'll be using paints today. So now you're trying to think to yourself, where, where do I get all those anodes and cathodes or negative and positive areas on the steel? If you actually look at steel under a microscope, it looks like this. There's a whole lot of little grains and some of them have a slightly negative charge and some of them will have a slightly positive charge. So there's where you get your anodes and cathodes from. And if you see them, here's some for you. They're all side by side, a little mixture there. So that's just a graphical explanation of what we just looked at. So, what is the corrosion of steel? It's the deterioration of a substance, usually a metal, or its properties because of a reaction with its environment. And that's what we've just seen. There are four conditions required for corrosion to occur. And unless all four conditions are present, corrosion will not occur. So what are they? Well, you get a positive pole to cathode, negative pole to anode, electrical conductor, well that's the metal, because metals conduct electricity, and an electrolyte and oxygen. Now we're just going to assume that oxygen is everywhere, so for the sake of this we won't talk about oxygen too much anymore. The issue I have is the cathode, the anode, and the electrical conductor are all in the metal. So the only thing we're missing is the electrolyte to start corrosion. Hence why we need to get water away from that. Yeah. So where does the water come from? Rain, mist, fog, sea spray, relative humidity, condensation, you name it, it's around us everywhere. So let's have a look at uh, water. This is a map. And what this map shows is it's a rainfall map, in this case, the North Island, over a period of time. And there's the different concentrations of rain. Now I'm going to put up a, a, the same map, but in a different way. It's the same area, but what do you think this is? Well, this is actually a corrosivity zone map. And that, the difference with this is it shows as you closer you get to the coast, the corrosion rate goes up. And it's very much different to the rainfall map. So why would there be a difference between these two maps? Well, salt and wind. And basically the wind blows over the sea, picks up the salt, especially from surf waves where you see all that white stuff in the air, that salt, and blows it inland, lands on the surface, mixes with the moisture and water, and the corrosivity goes up. So there's a big difference between rainfall where rain is actually good because it wash, helps wash the surface clean and corrosivity, which is the amount that steel corrodes with regard to either grams lost or microns lost in the thickness of the steel. So establishing the corrosivity, how they actually do it is they put a whole lot of steel coupons all around New Zealand and different places and they all measured before they put them out. And then after a certain amount of time, they pull them in and measure them and see how much metal loss you've got and equate that to microns loss per year, et cetera, et cetera. So most of where we live and most of our buildings and everything else in the cities and, and large towns, et cetera, a lot of them are coastal. So we're going to be at least C3 or C4, and in a lot of cases, C5. And Let's just have a look at C5 for a minute. 
because C5 is divided into marine and or industrial. So with industrial plants, you really need to call a corrosion technologist or something because they have chemical environments which are very, very different to normal corrosion, so it can be a lot higher there. But with regard to marine, C5 is basically next to the sea, but without open surf. And when you turn it into an extreme version, that is exposed to surf beaches. So St. Clair, St. Kilda Beach and Dunedin is a classic. Anywhere where you have the, a large amount of surf, right on the edge of the coast, you start going extreme. Now you can see a big difference between C4 high and CX extreme, 50 to 200 microns lost per year. So very important. From now on, and to make it easy, we just call them C1, C2, C3, C4. Right. So let's look at a macro climate, and the definition of that is the overall climate to which the structure is to be exposed. So we, for this example, we're going to use Auckland, just because it's easier to find the map on that one. This is a latest corrosion map, and it's from the NZ3404 standard, and they've just been updated in the last couple of years. Do note that that map does not have the geothermal zones in it, so they are quite harsh in themselves. But that's a discussion for another day. So there's a map of New Zealand, and one of the key things here is, as you can see, C4, because it's so close to the C, which is the orangey colored for the index code, it's not showing, but you can see it on top of the South Island on the left-hand side, and you can see that it's quite harsh in there, so they have shown it, because an orange line is not going to show up on that map very much, so they just left that down. But here's a close-up of the Auckland environment, and you can see that in the grey area, which is 500 metres from the sea, they have included all of these environments just to show you how harsh it is. And the C3, which is your green in there, is a little bit less harsh, but it's dependent on wind and all sorts of other things. But it's a good map to use to help establish what sort of corrosion protection system we're going to use in those areas. You can see that we're talking a lot about corrosion and corrosivity right at the start of this. It's important that we understand this because then we'll understand how to stop it or work around it. So here's another descriptive example of corrosivity environments under the ISO 9223 standard. So if you go down to C3 medium, there's your corrosion rate of 25 to 50 microns a year. It's coastal but also examples of interior environments could be food processing plants and breweries and dairies. Let's look at C4, which is 50 to 80 microns a year. And you've got more seashore calm, so it's next to the sea, like inland seaports, et cetera, et cetera. But in buildings, it's swimming pools, your livestock buildings, all that sort of thing. And then you can see the rest of them, et cetera, et cetera. You can download this later, but it's a good example to help understand where you are in the environment in conjunction with the maps. So this is slightly more important. This is microclimates, which are areas within that macroclimate that may create additional breakdown, make the environment more harsh. So these can include Dam locations are not dried out by sunlight. Protection from rain washing, because remember rain washes off the dirt in the salts, or helps to anyway, which reduces the corrosion rate. Exposure to industrial pollution, that can increase the corrosion rate. Hot or cold surfaces, specifically cold surfaces, they can compensate more, so their time of wetness is longer, so therefore more time for corrosion to react. Abrasion or impact, which can damage the coating. Wind direction effects, if you have predominant wind from one direction and it's going past industrial chemical plants or over a surf beach and coming onto the land, then that's going to bring more corrosive material with it. And topographical effects, which is the shape of the land, which can speed up or slow down wind and direction. So here's an example. There's some sheltered from rain wash situations. So the one on the left, you can see Left of the canopy, it's all nice and clean, and to the right underneath the canopy, it's quite dirty. So the dirts are just building up on that one. 
and they're not getting washed away. They're also not being maintenance washed, which they should be doing, and that's going to corrode more than on the left. And on the right hand side, you can see the garage door is towards the top of it, which is a little bit sheltered by rain. It's a lot of salts and dirt's built up and the corrosion is breaking through, but towards the bottom of the door, you can actually see it's a heck of a lot cleaner. So that's just a visual example of what we're talking about with microclimate effects. This is a classic photo was supplied to me by one of my colleagues, and it's the effect or angle of exposure, an example of differential weathering. All I'm trying to show you here is the bit at the top of the weatherboard is a 90 degree angle versus the red bits that are marked that are a lower angle, which means they get more exposure to the sun and the effects of ultraviolet radiation, etc., and a little bit more weathering too. So there's a classic in one example where it's changed the angle of exposure and you get a lot more damage from the, the effects of the environmental weather. So photos don't lie, and that's a classic photo for you to have a look at. Now, here's another page out of the 3404 standard. And what it's showing is just backing up what I've been talking about is, as an example, let's look at a C4 example, just for this case. So, the Within 500 metres inland of breaking surf, 50 metres of calm water, or whatever, we'll decide that. And in all situations, now surface specific means areas within that environment that can be harsher or a lot safer. So, as an example, we've got our C4. Now, if you've got a sheltered path like underneath a canopy, that same environment now it's worse and it's now C5 marine in this case. So anywhere under the canopy, it's a lot worse condition or higher corrosion rate than the overall environment that it's in. So that's what we call a microclimate. Now when you go inside the building, if it's nice and dry, it goes down to a C1, which is hardly any corrosion at all. So we're quite happy about that. But if we've got damp areas inside that building, bit of leaky building, bit of this or that, it can then go to a C3. So that's a good example of a macroclimate and then microclimates within the macroclimate. So we're going to just plug it along nicely here and let's see what can make things worse and design implications. Now these are just some good examples and I'll explain why and what's going on here. So in this example here, They've welded these bits of steel together and put them up there, but they will never be able to get around the back of them to actually prepare them or paint them, etc. And you can see it's already corroding behind and weeping down. So not the best design in the world. This one here was poor drainage. In this situation, the concrete floor was sloping in the wrong way and water accumulated around this area. And as you can see, chewed out the bottom of a column. Now, the concerning bit for me, that's a load-bearing structure, and um, I don't want that many corrosion at the bottom of a column. This is stitch welding. Um, it creates crevices. Now, there's reasons why they do do stitch welding. It reduces the amount of stress that's going into the steel and the amount of heat, etc. It's also cheaper, it's faster, etc. But it creates crevices. Moisture gets in those crevices, and as you can see, there's crevice corrosion. Now, if they'd sealed that up with some Siliflex MS or something like that, then we wouldn't have this problem. But there's so that's a way around it. But it's just an example of what happens when you do intermittent welding or stitch welding, as it's also called. And here's a classic: we've got steel threads coming out of the concrete wall with stainless steel washers and nuts on top, so you get to some of the metal corrosion. You've got crevices created, you've got sharp edges around the actual mountain bracket. It's just a nightmare, and that's on a building of Wellington, that one. So not the best combination of metals and design. And a colleague of mine sent this to me because he was trying to figure out that it's 10 years later and they're trying to maintain the, the end of this beam. Um, you can't even gain access to it. So if you have to have this in your sort of design, consideration needs to be given to the best coating system 
as possible to the areas that you'll never be able to reach again. So there are ways around it. You can put a better coating in those areas um, or seal the whole thing up. But that's just an example of how you need to prepare that and paint it in the future. So some things need to be considered when you're designing these structures. Now, preparation of steel. This is just as critical as good design and everything's as critical as each other. So we can't have gas cut edges and I have seen these on site by the way, so I'm not making this up. They're as rough as anything and coatings don't cover them very well as we'll see shortly. Weld spatter is the rough welding or weld spatter. The problem with the spatter is that it pokes up through the paint coating and it's thinner in protection starts to rust and then the rust goes underneath that surface. I see that a lot. The welders should be dressing the welds to remove all of that. Sharp edges is a classic. This is off a um, structure next to the wharf. When paint coatings go onto steel, when we're painting them, you've got to remember it's in a liquid form. And when it dries, it's a solid. When it's in its liquid form, it has surface tensions and tensions within the coating and they pull back from sharp edges, thus ending up with lesser paint coating like in the picture on the right there and less protection and corrosion breaks out and cuts underneath from there so that's just a classic example there and here's our friend mill scar which needs to be removed before you paint to get any long-term durability and i'll explain why now so what is mill scale? It's a type of iron oxide that's formed on the surface of the steel during the hot rolling process at the steel mill when the steel plates are being made. Now it ends up on the top of the steel. So mill scale is brittle. It expands less from the, than the iron from which it's formed and it cracks on cooling, microscopically that is. It is not uniform in composition and is cathodic to the steel. So we all know that steel expands and contracts. That's why you have all those gaps and those bridges when you go across bridges because the bridges expand so much during the day, especially in the sun. So if the mill scale doesn't expand as much as the steel, and steel expands and contracts, it's going to break and crack off, as you can see in the photo. But my primary concern is not only that, is that it's cathodic to the steel. And what that means is, is it acts as the cathode and the steel as the anode. So once you get some moisture and in amongst all those microscopic little cracks, then it corrodes underneath the mill scale and pops it off even faster. And the result is something like this. So in the left hand photo on the left is bringing the mill scale and then the scale breaking off. In the right hand photo, both of those situations, I've got photos of there of the mill scale failure with paint on top. They were Powerful all cleaned and they had the best paint you can imagine epoxies and urethane were put on them. And six months to a year later, that's what they look like. So we have to remove the middle scale. And here's a sharp edge. And here's a sharp edge that's been arrested or radiused, whichever word you'd like to use. And that takes about four seconds with a sanding disc and a grinder. So it's not that hard to do. And it creates a nice curve and you get good paint coverage from those areas. So that sort of leads us into what sort of preparation can we do on steel and what's it going to achieve and what's the, what's the best. So here's an example of some hand tool cleaning of some rusted steel. Now the one on the top is just moderate corrosion, mild corrosion. It's just all orange and reasonably uniform in colour. Don't have a problem with that as a corrosion guy. I'm sure you guys don't like it, but as a corrosion guy, I'm happy with that. The bottom one is when it starts to pit. And the problem with pitting corrosion is you see all those little black spots there? Underneath them is basically a pit in the steel and it starts drilling holes in the steel. So it's a lot harder to prepare and it does a lot more damage to the steel. And you know as well as I do, you start putting holes in the steel or eating away at the thickness, you're going to weaken its structural integrity. Okay. So it is about what you can do with a hand tool, you know, a wire brush, etc. etc. So it's, it's better than nothing, but it's not as good as if you're using power tools to assist you because there's a lot more energy in the power tools and you can get a lot better finish. 
So you can see powerful cleaning is a lot better than handful cleaning. But we're lucky in this modern day is with technology with the disks that you can use in power tools, you can now clean it up to almost perfect. Um, it does it a lot faster as well. So why would you settle for the one on the left when you can have the one on the right? What I'm trying to get at is, and you'll see in a minute, that the better the preparation, the longer the paint's going to last because the better foundation it's got to go onto. So there, there's some power tool and handle cleaning. They're not as fast as abrasive blasting. So let's have a look at that. Now, this is abrasive blasting standards chart, and some of you might have heard of SA two and a half or two and a half class blast. That's to do with the degree of cleanliness. So if we look at the top row, we've got some mill scale steel there, or some blasted steel with a bit of mill scale on it. And the commercial blast would be blast class two. And then the most common one is blast class two and a half. Most of you know it as SA two and a half. And that's 95% clean steel. And blast class three, which is absolutely 100% clean steel, is very expensive to do that. And mainly we do that on ship hulls or in heels in storage tanks, like petroleum storage tanks, et cetera, et cetera. Very expensive blast, and 99% of the time you don't need it. So blast class SA two and a half is what we do. Now, if you go down to the bottom, if you hit some very rusty steel, and you go to blast class two and a half, does it look the same as blast, the one at the top? No, it doesn't. So the degree of corrosion on your steel depends on what it's actually going to look like when you get to blast class two and a half. It's still 95% clean steel, but it looks a lot different, doesn't it? So often I like new steel to be used on jobs, and if people are using old rusty steel, you're going to get a different degree of look and appearance, and it's going to be a lot more coarser in nature. But that's, a, that's a good chart. It's supplied by Blast One to us, and that's going to be in the handout. So, good. Now, what are some advantages of using abrasive blast cleaning? Well, first of all, it's very efficient for cleaning of rust and mill scum, very efficient for that. And it also creates a profile. So slightly roughens the surface, which helps with mechanical adhesion. All right, so that's just physical mechanical adhesion. A coarse surface it's harder to remove paint from than a smooth surface. But what about chemical adhesion? And this is one of the key things for blasting. Is the abrasive blasting? We use garnish and and all those sorts of things. You'll often know it as sand blasting. We don't use sand anymore. Garnish is a lot more efficient. It's cleaner, there's less contaminants on the surface, um, it's, it's just more efficient. But what we're doing is not only increasing the surface area, but we're opening up more chemical bonding sites for the paint to chemically adhere to the steel. So not only have you got mechanical adhesion, you've got more reactive sites when you increase the surface area by roughening the surface, and you get better adhesion from the paint coating as well as removing all the rust and everything else. So, so that's why we abrasive blast and gives a lot more durability to the coating in the end. I just want to cover off blasting profile height because it has caused some issues with many people in the past. With garnet and the right selection and the right grades, you can get roughly a nice 30, 40 micron profile. Now, that's not much but it's more than enough for the polar bonding sites, for mechanical adhesion, for chemical adhesion, you name it. So when we paint it, you've got the surface to the valley and the surface to the peak of the profile. And let's just say that this is 75 micron coat of primer. That's how the gauge measures it, and that's what you're going to end up seeing. Now, if I use a coarse abrasive and get a high blasting profile height. I don't need that in this case for paint adhesion. I don't need it for more polar bonding sites. I've got enough with the 40 micron anchor profile. All it does is waste paint because the surface to valley is now much, much deeper compared to the surface to peak. And you can see how the gauge reads, which is surface of the paint to just under the peak. 
So I've just wasted an amount of paint. It's taking longer to dry. It could crack, it could have all sorts of problems. So we like to specify that the profile should be 30 to 50 microns, 40 being the mean of that. And it gets uh, everything you need without detrimental issues going on with the coatings or longer to dry. So the key here is surface to valley. So now we've done, we know what corrosion is, and we've looked at preparation of metals. Now we can look at protection options for the steel. So what have we got? Well, we could hot dip galvanize, or we could put some zinc paint on, or a thermal arc spray zinc onto a steel surface, and that's called sacred, and we leave it, and that's just called sacrificial protection. Right? We could put tapes and barriers on the steel to literally try to stop water getting to the steel, and that's called a barrier protection. We can actually try to change the atmosphere, and you do that with the air conditioning inside a building. So, as an example, or you can put different layers of paint on and use paint systems for steel. Now, paints are the most simplest and, in some cases, easiest to put on, but they have to be put on properly. So, how do paints actually protect the steel? If it's sacrificial, which is your zinc paints, water comes along and it sacrifices itself to protect the steel underneath. So it's self-explanatory. Inhibitive. So water comes along and it reacts with the water to inhibit the corrosion reaction that goes on on the steel. So that's called your anti-corrosive. So that's your anti-corrosive primers and that sort of thing. And then you've got barrier protection. So your water comes along and it just provides more of a barrier for the water molecules. It's harder for them to make their way through to the steel. And the key thing with this is we don't usually use just one coat of paint. We usually put a zinc on and then we either put an anti-corrosive primer or a barrier coating on top of that, or both. And then we put a top coat to make it look nice. That's all your colors in there. So it's defense and depth. Each layer protects the underlying layer. And the type and function and thickness of each of these different layers is very important. This is a common problem we have and we can come across. There's on the left hand side, we've got a bit of steel. We put on our 75 microns of, say, zinc paint. And then we've got 150 microns of our intermediate or barrier coat. And then we've got, say, 50 microns of your urethane top coat. So the total systems DFT, dry film thickness that is, it's, say 275 microns, that'll give you good 10, 15 years durability, you know, in the cities and all of that sort of thing. Now, same bit of steel on the right hand side. We put the zinc primer on, but it's a bit thin. Oops. And then we put some intermediate coat on and we didn't get that very as thick as it's meant to be. So let's just put a whole lot more top coat on to make up the thickness. So it all looks good. Well, that's wrong and it doesn't work that way because remember the type and function and thickness of each coat is very important. So there's a reason we specify them these ways and they have functionality to perform, which is resistance to water molecules, acid and alkali resistances, you name it. So as an example, here's a, here's a chart. Now, we're not going to go through it all today, but it's the properties of paint resins. And as an example, some things that you might be interested in is alkali resistance. Is you can see that epoxies are very, very good, but alkyds are very, very poor. Acrylics are very, very good. So that's why you don't use an enamel paint on, say, concrete outside, etc. Um, solvent resistance, you can see that the epoxies are good, the urethanes are good, so that's where you get your graffiti resistant coatings from. Chalk resistance, which is third from the top there on the left hand side. Acrylics are good. 
proxies are very, very poor, so that's why we don't use them outside without putting a urethane, which is very good chalk resistance on top. So you can see that having charts like that helps tell you the generic properties of paint types, your epoxies, your urethanes, your chlorinated rubbers, and you can use those to select which area you're going to use them in or in a combination with other ones. So it's a handy chart to have, um, but it is paint company's responsibility to tell you what coatings they're going to work and wear. But that's why we ask a lot of questions, often of you, of what's the exposure, what's, it going to be exposed, what's the temperature, where is it going to be, how long will it need to last. Chalking's not necessarily a bad thing, um, but if you don't want it to go chalky, which is all that white residue on it, and you want it to look good for a long period of time, then you need to put a urethane on top. So it's just an example. So here's something different too. Different paints have different properties, and problems can occur if used in the wrong place. And this has happened a few times, so just bear with me on this. But as an example, a steel fabricator has primed the steel with an alkyd general purpose primer. However, the specification that was issued or changed after the tender has been won calls for a zinc. Now, if that's the case, there's a major difference in durability between those two and overcoating them as well. So another one was there was a wool and it should be coated with a sealer undercoat and then it was to be tiled. However, the contractor top coated it with an acrylic paint and now the tile glue won't stick to it properly. So you can see that paints are specified for a reason and the specifications do need to be followed. And there's a big, there's a lot of you guys and us have the big picture and often the contractor, that's why it's important to, to talk with the contractors and explain why they're painting and where they're going to put the paint so that it will perform. And a little bit of communication goes a long way. And that's our job too. But um, if we all work together, it will make life a lot easier for these people. So here's some standards. We're not going to go through in detail, but some very handy standards that we use. And one is the 3404 standard, which is due to meet the durability requirements of steel structures and components that what you, you are all interested in. And that works in conjunction with the 2312 standard and that's for the guide for the protection of structural steel against atmospheric corrosion by the use of paints or protective coatings and version 0.2 is for same thing but on top of galvanized right so these are the main three standards that we use to come up with paint systems for you on your steel you've all seen that horrible looking thing New Zealand building code clause b1 structure but within it, basically, it talks about corrosion protection must run in accordance with the 3404 standard, which is that, and we've just presented that before. So the great thing with all the building codes and everything else, it resorts to that, and the great thing with that is all the paint systems that are inside that come from the 2312 standard. So you can see they're all interconnected and they work together which is nice for a set of standards when you think about it. So within the 2312 standard, there's some common paint systems and they end up on charts that look like this. We have some charts for you, which we can send you as well. And so you've got system designations, preparation products, thicknesses, and the durability in the right-hand side over there the different environments. So let's look at one here. ALK3, which is a coat of anti-corrosive primer and then a coat of enamel on top. You can see that a very low environment inside a building is 15 plus years durability, much more than that actually. And in a low environment, it's a little bit more. So a little bit less, I apologize about that. And in the C3, two to five years but you can see next to the sea or getting close to the sea you just can't use that system it's got no durability whatsoever so let's look at another system within that the inorganic zinc silicate these are just codes down the side so we've got 75 microns of that now you can see in a c4 environment it's 10 to 15 years durability whereas the alkyd primer and the gloss enamel has got 
hardly any durability. So different paints perform different ways on steel and in different environments. This is a uh, interesting one. This is a urethane system. So it's got an epoxy primer and a urethane top coat. And you can see in the C4, as an example, that it's not as durable as a zinc by itself. So there's ways around that is what we can do is here's a PUR5 system. This time we put on the zinc primer, then a barrier coat, then a urethane top coat. And in the C4, you can see it's got 25 plus years durability. So that would keep you quite happy. Now, just remember durability is time to first major maintenance. And it's not to say that minor maintenance, which is a touch up here and there, and touch up any damaged areas or premature breakdown areas, still need to be carried out. And that's done in your normal maintenance periods, which is different to major maintenance. Normal maintenance periods is every year or two, you have a look at the steel, and if there's damaged areas or small isolated breakdown areas, you, you touch them up. Now, there is one difference. If you go back to the first system we looked at, which is the ALK3, you'll see that it's a power tool. ST3 stands for power tool clean, or an SA2, which is just a commercial blast. So one could argue that if you did a SA2.5, that you might get a couple more years durability because you've got a better preparation and clean the steel to start off with. But that's splitting hairs for today's system. So what I'm trying to show you is better preparation, the better the coating system with the more amount of coats is selected for barrier properties and sacrificial and inhibitive properties and that sort of thing, the longer the paint's going to last. Now, a lot of you will be very interested in, well, how do I paint steel? It's going to be inside a building, but we're building in the middle, a couple of kilometres from the sea, in the middle of the city, a couple of kilometres from the sea, and we want some protection on it, and how do we design that system? Well, out of the 3404 standard, there's this chart here, which comes up with different paint systems that you can use and expose in the different environments for different amounts of time before you close the building in, and then that's still acceptable to be giving you your 50 years durability under the building code, all right? So I'm not gonna teach you how to use Chart, but it's basically there's some paint systems you can use, there's some durabilities it's going to give you, and we can definitely help you with that. But it is in the 3404 standard. And just while we're on that, you do realize that if you go to Standards New Zealand and look up the SNZ TS 3404 standard, you can download it, your own copy, for free. It is no charge, but you have to go to the site to download it yourself. Standards New Zealand made it free under the government, New Zealand government in conjunction with the building industry because it is such a handy document. So I suggest wait till the end of this webinar, but go to Standards New Zealand and download a copy for yourself and have a wee read of it. And we can work with you on that. We're making charts to help work in conjunction with that and they'll be available. So when can I paint? Paint shall not be applied when any one of the following conditions exist. The surface is less than 10 degrees. The ambient air temperature is below 10 degrees. Relative humidity exceeds 85%. Good luck, Auckland. But there's ways we can work around this. If it's higher temperature, which you get up in Auckland, then as long as the surface is 3 degrees centigrade above the temperature surrounding air, or dew point in that case, you don't have a problem. There's moisture or ice visible on the surface of the steel. Now you might laugh about that, but I have literally been on site and wiped my finger across the surface and a whole lot of water ran off and the person couldn't even see it that it was on there. So, and any other conditions stipulated if it's more restrictive to A and B. Some paints are sensitive to different things. So, and the engineer or representative can stop painting if there's like a storm on its way. Many people don't look up in the sky and look behind them to see if there's a big storm front coming in before they start mixing their paint. So that's just an example of that. Now, it's actually not that hard to measure relative humidity and surface temperature, and it's not from a website for MET service. You actually have to measure it on site because it can vary between 
different parts of Auckland or Christchurch or Wellington or wherever you're from. So you can't put paint on the cold surface because you can have moisture on it and that will interfere with the bonding, the chemical bonding to the steel and we don't want moisture underneath the paint because it can cause corrosion. And this can be easily measured using these sorts of things. So this is a sling hygrometer, surface temperature gauge, which is magnetic, and <coughs> a slide rule for calculating and figuring out what your humidity and dew points are. And by the time you filled, you only need to do that five or six times a day, and it really only takes a couple of minutes. And what we're trying to do is check that the surface is always three degrees above the dew point, so we can make sure it's dry and we can apply paint and it adheres well to the surface. So some of you say, well, why three degrees? Well, generally, if the suddenly the weather changes and it starts to cool down because steel is a lot denser than their surrounding environment generally. It holds onto the heat longer. So if you've just painted and the temperature changes in the air and it gets a bit colder, you've got less chance of condensation because the steel has still got time to cool down. Makes sense. And also, when you put paint on, when the solvent evaporates, it cools the surface. So there's another reason why we don't want it to be three degrees above in the first place. And just going back to that, um, if you can't be bothered slinging one of those around on site, you can get some very, 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 very high tech digital versions of these. They're a couple of $3,000 each, and it will do all of that for you, and it will log the temperature, which is good for your QA records. And this is what happens when this is the effects of moisture or water on the surface between drying and curing in the paint. You can see the spot marks of the water on the left hand side and the condensation marks on the right hand side, and this damaged the surface of the paint. So it does happen, and that's an example. So now we're up to the part of paint and substrate defects. Now, this section is actually put in here. Especially for if you're on site and you see something, it might give, help you understand what's going on. And for any painters that are watching, it might help you also understand what's going on, but some of them will happen straight away, so you have a chance to correct your reaction and stop them happening again. So it's a handy tool for everybody to have a look at. So let's have a look. And just so you know, you can actually buy manuals and books with lots and lots of these pictures in them. So it's not me just making up stuff. There's technical manuals out there in the world that show you what the defects are and the causality of them and how to prevent them and how to rectify them. So this is going to be a simple version, but I think it will be quite handy. So weld spatter, we've talked about that before, and that's to do with weld preparation. Telegraphing, well, this is actually to paint that they didn't feather the edge, as you can see by the arrow there and you end up with thick bits and then on the area where it was bare they put a very thin coat of paint on so you've got some breakthrough there but feathering of the edges it just makes it look cleaner and tidier it's just a mess that job sifting now that can end up with little round dots or dramatic like in the photo and that's paint preparation or surface oils or oil in the spray foam um, also wrong thinners can cause it um, it's about surface tension and the paint and liquid form just pulls apart on the surface. You know? And rust spotting, this is your classic. This is a high blast profile with a low film thickness of paint. So you remember the blast profile with those little peaks on it? Well, they point, stick through, and if the paint's not thick enough, then that's what rust spotting looks like. Looks like a rash. Okay. This one here is solvent popping, and it's a pain in the neck, and it's an interesting one. It's caused by hot weather and direct sun, in conjunction sometimes with strong wind and fast solvents. So what actually happens is, as you're painting and putting the paint on the surface, it's drying, the top of it's drying very, 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 very fast, and the underneath then traps the solvent that's trying to evaporate, and the solvent pressure builds up and pushes and make these little balloon shapes on the surface, and then the vapor just diffuses through them. So look out for those ones. And this is bubbling, which is the back to front version of solvent popping, and it's from a porous surface. So often on concrete, you may see this, or spraying 
slow drying epoxies like on top of porous inorganic zinc silicates is another example on top of thermal wax spray without sealing properly. So it looks like little volcano craters left behind. These are pinholes and holidays. So this is just isolated breakdown points in a paint coating that where the rust is breaking through. So you can see the rest of it's fine, but it's just got spots, which is either isolated damage or a few pinholes, which are voids in the coating for various reasons. Poor surface, lack of seal coat, voids, spot damage, all of that sort of thing. In dry spray, ugh, that's where you look that sandpaper looky finish with a dull finish on your paint. High spray pressure, too far from the surface, hot weather, direct sun, strong wind, fast solvents, all of those together. It's basically the paint's half drying before it hits the surface, and it looks just awful. And you've all seen this before. You've got a nice painted job, and you bring the steel or whatever the surface is substrate to site, and it's all nice and looking. And then somebody's grinding on site, and all those sparks that come off the grinder, you, where are they going to land? So it just makes a mess of a great paint job that was nothing wrong with it in the first place. Delamination, lack of preparation when you're painting one coat over another, painting one coat on and leaving it too long before you put the next coat on. Some epoxies are classic like that. Epoxies dry and then they cure. Once they cure, they've gone too hard to receive another coat without a lot of sanding and preparation. So that can be two, three, four, five days later before you put the next coat on, and this can happen. So watch out for that. Or if you just never sanded some paint, old paint in the first place, and just slapped another coat over the top. So peeling, delamination, very, very similar. Uneven application, it's a classic. But as you can see, some the rust grinning through there and breaking through it in other areas is not. That's actually been brush painted, and you can see that they haven't overlapped properly, so it's uneven application, lack of overlapping, and low film thickness in some areas, and it's thicker in others. So just an example. Runs and sags, self-explanatory, you've put it on too thick, or you've thinned the paint too much. So they just look unsightly um, and just are not acceptable. Solvent attack. That's where you overcoat too early, you overcoat with the wrong paint type, you spill some solvent on the surface, or you use the wrong thinner. It's like crocodile, it's, it, it, it's literally attacking the coating, just like paint stripper does. So it looks like paint stripper, that's what's going on there. Wrinkling is another classic. This is where the top of the paint's dried and underneath is still drying and then you've suffered some cooler conditions like overnight. So if you're painting to four or five o'clock in the evening at this time of year, which is now getting in close to winter, when getting a lot colder, then tension on the top where it's dried will pull and make those wrinkles when that underneath is still soft and still trying to dry. So that's a good example of that. Mud cracking. You'll see that in sealing paints and inorganic zinc silicates when it's put on too thick, it just pulls apart and cracks. It has lower strength than normal paints because of the high pigment concentration, and that's just what causes it. It's just too thick. And crazing and splitting. This is often seen in alkyd type coatings, but it can be in any type of paint where it's been applied too thick and it just dries on top. It's still drying underneath when a whole lot of stress is formed and it starts to put the stress into the coating. And as the paint cures over a period of time, the stress builds up and it pulls the paint apart. The too thick for the resin type, stress build up over time and it can take weeks to see. So the paint will like, Go onto the steel, goes to the job, looks fine. It's too thick in the first place. The QA wasn't done or wasn't checked. And then over weeks and weeks and weeks, then this can appear. Another classic is this is a photo that I put together for a project I was working on. If you're dealing with old paint systems, you need to feather the edges before you do the touch-ups. And this is an example. It's not a car. It's just this is a big industrial lighthouse, actually. And all I was trying to show is if you actually taper the edges, you get a lot 
better touch up and a lot better looking end result. So it's just an example of feather and edges and what we're trying to do. Now here's some words, so don't read it all, I'll read the important bits. There's a whole lot of arguments about dry film thickness and how do you measure it and how do you average it and everything else. And there's all sorts of standards that we use, but this is from the 2312 standard, which is one of the standards we use in New Zealand. And basically there's a method and procedure for checking the, the dry film thickness of paint. And that method basically involves, we take a whole lot of measurements and the mean of all of those measurements must meet the nominated dry film thickness, so the film thickness specified. Some of those measurements can be, individual measurements can be 80% of the nominated dry film thickness, as long as once you average them all out and add them together and average them all out, that they meet the nominated dry film thickness. Okay, so that's just the classification for that. And another section, avoid areas of excess thickness, because excess thickness can cause all sorts of problems with paints. They can crack, they can split, they can wrinkle, they can do all sorts of things. So you need to avoid putting the paint on too thick, you need to avoid putting it on too thin, and that's where the skill and qualifications of the painters and industrial applicators come in to apply the right amount of paint for you. So what does Rosine specify? And what do we have to say about all of this? Well, we specify, and this is from a typical specification that we write, is film thickness quoted needs to be achieved. It's the minimum. Do not exceed these thicknesses by more than 20% of that specified. Now, if they have to, or if they can't avoid that, then they can talk to the paint company and say, can we put it on a little bit thicker and if we do, what's the implications of that? And we can advise them on that, okay? So this comes down to a little bit more of what can Rosine do and what is our responsibilities? And this is with any paint company, by the way. So our job is to supply paint which needs to be suitable and fit for the purpose it's intended to be used for. It is then the responsibility under contract of the painter to prepare the surface and then apply the paint under suitable conditions, that's application drying and curing, at the correct wet film thickness to achieve the correct dry film thickness that has been specified and accepted and approved by the paint company and also the specification. If there's an issue with the applied paint, then this now becomes contractual. The end owner needs to contact the main contractor who needs to talk with the subcontractor or painter to resolve these issues. The painter then, if he or she believes it is a paint issue and not an application issue, then needs to talk to the paint supplier, e.g. Rosine. Okay. So we offer site assistance, which is Rosine representatives can visit site specific jobs as required to assist with advice on adequacy of preparation, special matching, standards application, etc. However, this is not supervision, it's site assistance. And I'll explain why in a second. We are not inspectors and it's not our job to do QA reports. That's for the contract to complete. And that's for the contract as well. So if you do cadence inspection, from our point of view, paint company has a conflict of interest. So if we get asked to do carry out some actual coatings inspection, which is detailed by the way. We cannot carry out detailed inspection of paint coatings, ambient conditions, surface preparation standards, application, dry film thickness, and reporting of paint projects. This is, we can do little ones, but not the whole job. We can and offer the site assistance, as an example, but it's very different from detailed inspection and report writing. Site assistance can and does involve spot checks of film thickness and general advice, but not full inspection for the following reason. We've just about finished. Detailed inspection, as detailed above, by the supplier of paint is not only very time consuming, somebody's got to pay for it, but creates a conflict of interest and therefore can cause major issues with both the contractor and the principal, as both parties are con clients of the supplier. So that's us. 
for this reason, there are independent inspectors that can carry out this type of work, and then this avoids any conflict of interest, therefore serving all parties in a fit and proper manner. And not getting all authoritative on that, I'm just trying to say it creates a big problem for all of us when there's conflicts of interest and he says, she says. And in fairness, it is the job of the contractor to do a lot of their own QA. And that's easily done with, let's have a look at some paperwork. There's actually a AS3894 standard that covers off QA documentation that we quote all the time. And you can purchase these and it covers off the weather conditions, the ambient surface conditions, what sort of preparation was done, so as an example. Then there is the equipment report, which covers off the work area, what sort of abrasive blasting or wet film and dry film thickness was specified and achieved, all of these sorts of different bits and pieces. Air supply was checked, tested, all of those things. And then another version, which is the 0.12 version of it, was inspection for the coating, all the batch numbers, the thickness of each coat, specified the averages, maximums, minimums, all of those sorts of things. And they, of course, can also be purchased from Standards Australia, and or a lot of paint contractors will have their own QA documents that cover most of those things for you. So they are very, very handy, especially if there is a problem and we can't do anything. Now let's have a look at durability. It's important to understand the durability of a coating system and the environment which is to be exposed. It's also just as important to have in place a maintenance system with a plan on when to recoat to keep the entire system looking good and in good condition. Top coat is designed to protect the underlying coats and the underlying coats are designed to protect the substrate. And note that coating type is only one factor in determining the durability of a protecting coating system. Surface preparation, application procedures, design, local variations in the environment, and other factors will all influence the durability of coatings. So we've looked at the basics of corrosion, what causes it and how it can change in different environments, macro and micro environments, design implications, preparation of steel, the better it is, the longer it's going to last, paints and system standards, which you can all relate to and refer and reference. Painting conditions, common defects seen, QA documents, and durability and maintenance. So that's the end, and I'd like to take this time to thank you for your attendance, and that's all from me. Well, uh, thanks so much, John. That was a super interesting presentation, and I think uh, you've just taken it all to another level. So. Um, and I'm sure there's plenty of info for people to take away from that one. Um, just a reminder for people as well, the webinar will be on our website in a few days, along with the presentation that John's just given, so the slides, and certainly be available for you to download. Um, as mentioned as well, any questions that you've typed in today, and there were a lot of really good ones coming in, um, we'll come back to you directly and answer. And I think John may have actually answered a few of the earlier questions that came in as, as he's progressed through the presentation. Um, just a note also, John's going to be presenting next week, so same place, same time. Uh, and we're doing an in-depth look at uh, timber and coatings, which is another area of John's expertise. He does wear a few hats at Rosine. Uh, so please do look out for the uh, link on the follow-up email that you'll get tomorrow. So jump on there and register if you haven't already. So John, thanks again. Uh, very much appreciate you taking your time out today to present and uh, I'm sure everyone agrees that that was an extremely informative session for us all. So that's us done for the day folks. Uh, all the best to you out there and stay safe and bye for now. <laughs>